Hi, my name is Dave Heller. I'm a furniture maker in Charlottesville, Virginia, and I'm here at The Wooden Shop in Earliesville, Virginia, um, which is a woodworking school where I hope to be teaching a little later in the year. So last time I was here, I talked a little bit about my work and I demonstrated mitered uh, London style dovetails. Uh, we ran out of good light to shoot, so um, we picked it up again today and I am going to talk about veneering and inlay, mostly inlay, but uh, um, a lot of over, it overlaps with veneering. So that's what we're going to talk about. So what, ex what do we, what are we talking about here? So, so this is a, the edge of a table. Um, uh, this is just a sample I made some time ago. So mahogany veneer, cross banded mahogany veneer with two pieces of black uh, veneer uh, banding. So whether this, you know, this is clearly veneering, but it, whether this is inlay or veneering is kind of uh, up to you. I consider this to be veneering because I did this all as a sheet. I did it sequentially, but I was not cutting. To me, inlay involves cutting into things. This did not involve cutting into anything. Similarly, this was veneering, but very similar look. That's a drawer front. Here's a sample piece that I made for somebody, uh, demonstrating something very similar. Again, the black veneer could be inlay. This is definitely inlay. What we've got here is a mother of pearl um, sheet, which has been inlaid into a piece of solid purple heart. And um, this is actually quite difficult because these lines are not parallel to anything, so you can't use the edges as references. And uh, if you don't make it exceptionally well laid out, your eye will see the errors. So that is one of the aspects of doing this kind of work is there is a precision required both in laying out what you're going to do and then in doing it. Of course, if you lay it out wrong, you can guarantee it's not going to look right. So get your layout right, and then we'll work on technique. <clears throat> so here's a classic for that kind of work. This is, so this is, this is, I would consider this to be veneering. Um, this, I make a lot of chess boards, um, which I sell at um, craft shows. Um, this looks nicer than most. Um, chess boards you can buy. Um, this one is plain. This one, I'm not as fond of the colors on this one myself, but this one has inlay in it as well. A mother of pearl dots um, spread around the edges. And um, you can be as calm or as crazy with your mother of pearl dots and mother of pearl shapes as you would like. You can also inlay other pieces of veneer. Um, and in fact, this is a class that Joshua and I have talked about um, holding here, is making a chessboard using veneering, so introductory uh, veneering techniques combined with inlay techniques. And if you already have some veneering experience, um, you can make the patterns more difficult and um, make quite a complex looking chessboard. And the theory is on the first day you would make the chessboard and then on the second day you would do some inlays. So let's talk a little bit more about <clears throat> what you could inlay. So the first thing that you can inlay into wood is wood. <clears throat> it's a really cool thing to do. Um, here's some inlays that I made myself. These are called bandings and they go very nicely around the edges of boxes and that sort of stuff. Um, inlay is about dressing up your piece. Um, you, if you want a piece that has a little more pizzazz, um, then inlay is a really cool way of doing that. It was very popular at certain times historically, and there are modern, um, there are modern, uh, techniques that are similar. So this, for example, so these, these are <clears throat> patteri. 
So what patteri are, are the little objects that, are, that you inlay into the top of federal tables and in, into the legs of federal tables right up below the skirt. And the, this is a mod, my modern interpretation of it. This is Osage orange with a little piece of black veneer around it. And if you drop that into a cherry table leg, it is really sweet. So, and this Osage orange came out of my um, front yard. <laughs> it was a branch that I trimmed off a shrub that I had and um, it was just too good to uh, throw away. So I sliced it up into thin pieces and um, made those. Um, so there we, there we have a piece of um, alternating walnut and maple. And all I did was I, I have a big block of it and I sliced a couple pieces off. And you say, well, gee, what's that for? Um, oh, come on, Dave. There we go. <laughs> so we can glue those together and we've got a simple banding. We could put a piece of veneer between them and one on each side and we've got a more complex piece of banding. This is how, this is how bandings are made. They're, they're repetition, repetitious um, pieces, small pieces. So here's, here's a block that, that this one came from at some point, which is just made up of a bunch of small pieces of veneer. A different type of inlay. So this is a piece of eighth inch ebony with a piece of holly veneer glued to the bottom and then a piece of black veneer glued to that. And you can inlay that, if you were to make a box, similar to this, but the box were made out of veneer, then these corners would be very fragile. So if you then routed grooves around those edges, you could inlay these pieces into the edges and get a really, let's do it this way. <laughs> um, so you've got the solid ebony on the corners to protect the box and you get a really elegant pinstripe effect around the box. So those are some things that you can make yourself and, and your imagination, let me show you here for example, where I just showed you the ebony, this is the curly maple equivalent thereof, right? So it's rather than being a black piece with a white stripe and a black, this is a white piece with a black stripe and a white stripe. Same idea. And you do that in curly maple and you inlay that into a box and you sand that all up and put a nice coat of shellac on it and pff, it's sweet, really sweet. And it looks really elegant and people can't really figure out how you did it. And it, that's always one of my objectives when I make a piece is that in the end people look at it and they just can't figure it out. And it's just a couple more steps beyond your basic production. So as an alternative to, uh, <laughs> to um, making your own, you can buy it. Um, there are a lot of um, patterns of, um, of inlay out there in the world. Um, all of these can be made, um, but most of them are time consuming enough that you really don't wanna do that. So um, I do buy a lot of them, as you can see. Um, whether I use my homemade stuff or the stuff I've purchased depends on the application. <clears throat> so there's wood. Um, when you're inlaying wood, into wood, you always set your inlay so that it is above the surface, the finished surface of the wood, and then you sand or scrape, scrape mostly, your banding down flush with the surface um, because you want it to be nice and smooth and you don't, if you were to inset the banding too deep, you would have to lower the whole level of the box top, which you really don't want to do. So that is one of your other um, requirements when you do this kind of work is that you're very precise in terms of your depth. Um, Mother of Pearl, which we're inlaid there, you also set it proud and you sand it down. Um, 
mother of pearl or abalone dust is toxic, so you have to wear a dust mask. It's more toxic than sawdust, considerably more. So um, please don't inhale that stuff. So um, let's talk a little bit about other things you can inlay. So here, for example, here's mother of pearl diamonds. And um, here, let me put them on here to make them. Um, a lot of the uh, mother of pearl products are sold primarily to luthiers uh, for banjo makers and guitar makers. So, um, so Stuart McDonald is a good source if you only need a few. He's quite expensive. I can't really blame him because this is a real specialty product. If you go through a lot of these the way I do, um, I have um, had success on eBay um, buying them from importers. Um, because these, these things are, of course, all made in other, in other parts of the world because that's where the seashells come from. And they're imported into the U.S. And eBay gives them a sales mechanism for reaching their customers. So I've, I've had good success buying um, Mother of Pearl. So there's Mother of Pearl dots. <clears throat> so I guess these are abalone, technically. Um, and they come in uh, about a dozen different varieties, uh, meaning colors. So different seashells from different parts of the world. Again, you set these slightly proud and you sand them down. Let's do something a little different here. These are hematite, which is some sort of um, semi-precious stone. You can buy them from um, jewelry um, parts companies. And, um, and you can inlay them. And these you can't sand. They're, they're harder than sandpaper. So you have to set them very precisely, or you have to choose to set them proud. I would never set them in, but I might set them proud on purpose. Depend on the application. So um, here's something else you could inlay. So these are, um, these are cloisonne. I guess you could buy them. I made these. Um, it's an, using enameling techniques is a completely different thing, but these are glass. And so again, you can't sand them. You would set these proud. Um, ceramic tiles, something else you can use. Um, decorative tiles. Um, Motawi makes gorgeous um, arts and crafts style tiles, and they would look really cool in the right piece of furniture. And again, that would be inlay. So. Um, let's talk a little bit about tools um, because that there are ways of making our lives a little easier or harder if you prefer that. <laughs> um, so um, for those of you um, who like to make it a little bit harder, we have these here hand tools. Um, so this one is my favorite hand router uh, with its um, 1 16th of an inch um, tooth on it. And I use this for um, leveling the bottoms of grooves, funnily enough. <clears throat> um, this one, even though it's a much smaller router, it has a much bigger tooth. Um, so, um, but this is really handy for, um, for something that I will show you later. Um, so the, my base tool for these kinds of things is this one. So this is a uh, Dremel, and it has a, um, it, this one has what, uh, maybe a 5 64ths bit in it, um, which we will use shortly. It's a wonderful little tool for making flat bottomed holes. Um, when you are inlaying mother of pearl, like I showed you those mother of pearl diamonds, it's really important that the because mother of pearl is both fragile and brittle, if it is not evenly, so here's my mother of pearl. If I lay my mother of pearl in a hole that is convex, so it's only supported in the center, then when you tap it down, it's gonna break. I can tell you this absolutely for sure. <laughs> not that it's ever happened to me, but I have it on good authority. <laughs> 
So never have a bump in the middle when you're working with mother of pearl. Flat is perfect. Concave, so it's supported around the edges, is better than convex. But flat is perfect. And that's why I use this tool. It's not because I'm a power tool freak or anything. It's that I want a nice flat bottom in my hole so that I can lay. So what I do when I'm cutting something, a shape, whether it's a, a big shape like this or those diamond shapes. So if I were doing this, I would draw, very carefully draw around this. I would then use a big router because I'm gonna take all of that wood away except the outer 16th of an inch. Because I will have scribed with a knife around this. I will take the center out, but I will leave the edge and I will use a tool like this to pop out. So I will be using the flat generated by this as my reference surface for this and I will be using a hand tool, either a chisel or a router plane to pop that wood out all the way around the edges so that I have this even hole. That's what we're gonna do. Easier said than done slightly, but it's, it's mostly a matter of knowing where you're going. If you know where you're going, it's not that hard to get there. And of course, if you don't know where you're going, anywhere is where you land up. <laughs> Okay, so the, uh, one of my other really important tools for this kind of work is this. And I, I believe these are called dial calipers. Uh, they work in thousands of inches and they work just as well in metric. But um, because we're making holes that are of very particular depths, one of the things that we would, for example, want to do is if I were making a hole for this, I would want to know how thick my hole is. So that's, that, that, this piece is 92 thousandths of an inch thick. So if I wanted to set that in and have it just a hair proud, I might, I would route a hole 80 to 85 thousandths deep, which I can do with these tools and I will then use this to measure the depth of the hole to confirm that it's where I want it to be, okay? Really handy tool. Um, and as, as you get further and further into precision work, having a tool like that is invaluable. Okay, so we are now, I'm going to demonstrate, this is a piece of um, walnut burl veneer which is inlay which is glued to a backgammon board so this is the outside this surface is the outside surface of a backgammon box and so we have this nice panel and i am going to inlay a piece around the outside but i'm going to cheat because inlaying Cutting a, a precise groove around the edge of something is fairly challenging once it's glued into the case, but before it's glued into the case, it's a lot easier. So that's what we're gonna do here. So I'm going to take a second to set up and then we're gonna demonstrate how to do that. So back in one second. Okay, so I'm back. I have clamped my panel to the board. This is what we are going to inlay around the edge of this panel, okay? This here would be my cutting gauge, and it is miraculously already set at exactly the width of this. So I scribe along here. Now, if you were doing this, I would highly recommend that you glue this panel up the one day and you do this work on the edge of the panel the next day, or maybe even the same day, depending on which kind of glue you're using. Um, because the, um, the glue would not have completely set then and it's much easier to pop the veneer off. Um, that was our, my intention when I did this, but um, a month has passed. So this glue's pretty dry. And I'm looking for my ruler and I can't see it. Ah, there it is. 
Sorry, I'm off screen. I'm running back. Here we are. So, sandpaper on a straight edge, right? Wonderful tool. It's really important to have cut all the way through the veneer, especially when the glue's been setting a month. So, I've used my Olfa 18 millimeter cutter, box cutter. I use this for an enormous amount of veneering work. With the black Japanese sharpened blades, this is a great tool. Okay, so I've scribed through here. Pairing chisel. I like my three quarter inch pairing chisel because it is long enough that it gets almost the whole way across here. And so what I'm doing is I'm just popping that, because I've already cut through the veneer, all I'm doing is lifting the veneer very gently off of the substrate, which even though it's been a month, it's still working. There is, the, the, wood, the two pieces of wood are in much better harmony than they would have been if I had only um, left it one day. So that is how I would go all the way around and then I would glue it into the box and it would look like this. So here's my three millimeter or so groove. Okay, so I've, I took the other panel like this and glued it into the frame here. And now I will show you one of the things that I learned fairly recently. When you are um, working with a panel like this, where it's a large surface and you've applied glue to both surfaces, it occasionally will, um, how we say, distort a little bit. In fact, you can guarantee it. Um, and so the thickness of this inlay, so the thickness is 40 thousandths, okay? which doesn't sound like very much, but it's almost twice as much as the thickness of that veneer, which is about 22 thousandths. So the problem is if we've got curvature in this board, all we did was we, when we took the veneer away, we now have a 22 thousandths groove around the outside, which is great. 22 is enough. But what's not enough is six or something. So if that board has curved, it curves up in the corners. And what can happen is that you lay your inlay in, and then when you're flushing this all to level, it's possible to go right through the banding because it's curved up enough that the levels, you don't have enough thickness for the piece of wood to be opaque. So what we need to do, sorry, this will take me a second here. Oh, come on, Dave. There we go. So we're going to let We're going to set our router so that we're going to set our router so that it is not engaging in the center. And then we're going to go out to the corners and we're going to check the corners. See, I got a little bit of lift there. That it had rolled up just a little bit by using this little tool here, 
I have provided a little extra depth. Hmm. There we go. So it's worth checking your corners. So again, so, so the last half inch there, it had rolled up. So by doing this, um, what that means is that when I set these pieces in, which I'm not going to do today, but if I did, then um, when I sanded everything level afterwards, sanded and scraped, I'm not going to go through the banding. And the reason this is near and dear to my heart is, of course, that I went through the banding on the last one I did a couple weeks ago. And I have written a blog post <laughs> on how to repair it because it's quite involved. It took me at least an hour, maybe closer to two hours to repair the damage. I'm very pleased with the outcome, but that sure was a lot of work um, that wouldn't have been necessary if I had done this little um, test with my hand router to make sure that the depth was even. Because that's really all you're doing with the router, right? Is if you go all the way around with it and it doesn't engage anywhere, then your groove was the right depth to start with. But if it catches in the corners or anywhere else, it means it was high there. And it's not very high, but 10 thousandths makes a huge difference here. This is precision work. So um, I highly recommend a tool like this and checking those corners in this, if you use this particular technique. And now we're going to demonstrate a different technique. We're going to inlay one of these mother of pearl abalone things into a piece of cherry. This is Joshua Farnsworth. If you're interested in learning traditional woodworking with hand tools, visit my website at woodandshop.com where you can find free video tutorials, workshop tours of amazing traditional woodworkers, and tool buying guides. You can ask questions and share your projects with thousands of woodworkers on my free traditional woodworking forum. Make sure you subscribe to my regular blog posts and also check out my 10 steps for getting started in traditional woodworking. Enjoy!